Fernay Muñoz with Wireless LAN Professionals, preferred scanning channels. We've been talking about it for a while. I think this has been one of the most difficult presentations I've put together. I mean, they're all difficult. But this one, you know, I had to ask a lot of questions, and I think that's one of the most difficult parts, is to ask questions, because you're an expert, and if you ask another expert about something, I'm afraid that they're going to say, like, you're a CWNE, and you don't know that. And sometimes we have to ask a lot of questions. Channels. <clears throat> why are preferred scanning channels important? Why is this a topic that we all here in this room and people watching this later will have to care about? This will affect how your infrastructure treats your clients. It will affect how it performs. It will affect clients. How is it that clients are going to use or not use PSEs? And tools. Are tools going to use this? Can they use this or not use this? And how is this relevant to what we do? So let's start with the basic stuff. 2.4, we had primary channel, we had multiple channels, 1, 6, and 11, nothing secret about that. We share spectrum with other technologies. We've seen these charts you know, for years. 5 gig, sure. We have 5 gig, mostly harmonic everywhere. Notice at the end of 5 gig, uh, there's this dedicated short range communications and the uh, intelligent uh, transportation uh, system. That spectrum is for them, that's not for us. We've seen this chart also for many years with the addition of Uni4 that was added later. Many people didn't care about it, but it's there. It's assigned to us, we could use it as well. We are familiar with the Spectrum Ask. This is the, uh, a, a 20 megahertz wide channel. No secret about it. Don't worry. I will not waste your time. I don't like to waste your time or my time. We all need this, and we need to understand this. Because yes, with Wi-Fi 5, we got 80 megahertz wide channel, which is not an 80s, 420s put together. And in a perfect world with rainbows and unicorns, this is what we would have in our network. No CCI, no ACI, no OBSS, perfect. Real life is not as clean and pretty as that. Five gig will have its challenges. We run out of spectrum to four or five got congested. We begged and asked for more frequency. And we got it. In the US we got 1.2 uh, gigs. We got 59 channels and more questions started coming up. Like, whose brilliant idea was to start again with channel one? Because now we have two channel one, channel one in 2.4, channel one in six gig, and we have some in, 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 in five gig as well. Channel 161, channel 165, and I, I still don't know. Is it the IEEE, is it the FCC, is it the ITU, I don't know. For whatever reason, one of the uh, um, uh, stories out there is that if we had continued with 177, when we left off with 5 gig, then it would have been like 181, 185, and so forth. We would have passed channel 255, which will be more than 8 bits. That's one side. It can make sense. But I looked into uh, the uh, field for channel, and that has two octets. So it's got more than 8 bits. So I don't know. That, that could be it. It also, they probably, uh, the other story is that they didn't want it to sound like, this is a continuation of five gig. This is something new. Just, we're gonna start from scratch channel one and going up. Anyway, who cares? It is what it is, but it's kind of like one of those questions that you ask or you get asked, and then kind of curious. But then, <clears throat> with more spectrum came more challenges. We got it, perfect. The first challenge was, this is not harmonic. It's not like 2.4 that everywhere you can find 2.4 available. This has been a struggle to get it available everywhere. This is not a comprehensive list. There's more out there. If you want to kind of stay on top of things, check the 6 gig info site or the Wi-Fi Alliance. They will provide good information. The next challenge. <laughs> if we're going to uh, do passive scanning and let's say we stay one transmit unit per channel listening for beacons, 
Then for us in the US with 11 channels, that's kind of how long it will take. For Europe, we have 13 channels. That's kind of like what it will take, six gig. That is if a device were to scan channel per channel per channel and stay one transmit unit on each one of them. One thing we're not accounted for here is switching time. Because there's some 15 to 20 milliseconds that it will take for devices to change from one channel to another channel within a band. And if we do the math and add them up, plus about 40 milliseconds that it takes to switch from one band to another band, then now we're gonna have, it's gonna take a long time to scan all those channels. If we're doing an active scanning, yes, it's faster. Send a probe request, get a probe response. But what if you are in a congested environment and you have multiple SSIDs, so you're gonna get multiple probe responses. And you're gonna get, of course, everybody has to contend and wait for their turn to send you the probe response. Bottom line, the more you scan, the more battery your device is gonna consume. So, one challenge right there. Now, <clears throat> ooh, did it freeze, come on. So it's my turn to be here now. Okay, if we look at the, if we look at the spectrum with this six, let's just zoom in in the first part of it. I know some of you are looking like, that's not the center frequency for channel one. That's where we, because remember we got from uh, 5929, that's where it starts. But if you remember five gig, it ends, and then we have that dedicated short range communication frequency band, and then if you remember that spectral mask, and if we were to put a 20 megahertz wide channel right there in channel one, we would have energy bleeding into that frequency space which is something we don't want to do with people that already own that frequency space. So they said like, okay, we cannot do that, so how can we make it better? And say, well, what if we sacrifice the first 20 megahertz of what we got allocated, and we make that a guard band? So we don't use it, and now we have a guard band. And now, even with that band, and even with the band pass filters that we have, and with all the programmable um, synthesizers and all the cool technology we have nowadays, we would still have bleed into those. So they say, okay, the scanning time and this problem of bleeding energy into those adjacent frequencies, we can solve by adding a preferred scanning channel and making that primary kind of like a little bit to the side. So that's where, why the second uh, of every 80 is our preferred scan channel. So that kind of answers or addresses a couple of those issues with scanning time and stuff. Then, since the primary channels are the ones carrying all these management and control frames, then now we have less scanning because devices will only scan those, um, those preferred scanning channels. And if you're doing an 80 megahertz wide transmission, yeah, energy is still gonna bleed you know, side to side, but then it's still uh, having all the management on the primary, which I believe PSCs was synonym of primary channel. Boy, was I wrong. So, there you have it. <clears throat> if we look at this from the PSC perspective now, we have uh, preferred scanning channels, and they happen to also align with uh, other channel widths, like 160s. And I'm not even gonna touch on 160s and 320s, because that's another mess. But what happens if you go into a 40 megahertz wide channel plan? Now you're gonna have the need for some primaries that don't line up with those. Let's just kind of look at the 500, which is what we have here in Europe, but it applies to the other uh, bands that we have. If you have 80 megahertz wide channel, then we have six, and we have the PSCs, the second of uh, every one of those, and they line up very well, like in this case that we have these access points here, then they are in one of those, and they line up very well. But what if vendors do not use those preferred scanning channels? Because they are 
not mandatory scanning channels, or we'll be talking about MSCs, right? They are preferred. So if you have a 40 megahertz channel plan, if you happen to have a PSC in one of those, then life's good. But how about then the next guys that do not have a PSC in them? They're not going to be as lucky because they don't, how, how are they going to be found? So we're going to have the challenge that how are devices, if devices are only scanning PSCs and see what beacons are being announced there, then the ones that don't have PSCs won't be found. So we have something like this. Now this 80 megahertz wide channel plan kind of doesn't align with anything, doesn't match. And in a network like this, if the vendor is announcing its networks on the first channel, so a client would come and scan channel 5 and 21 and 37, and there's nothing. So it's not going to find anything. Now, if your tool that you use to do surveys does not scan channels that are not PSCs, either because it can or because you forgot to check the scan non-PSCs, then you're not going to find any networks. This is going to show nothing. So yeah, you might have 40 megahertz wide channels because we don't have enough spectrum or because we have way too many access points. This is the case uh, of, of a stadium, for instance. We have a big open space and lots of APs. And yes, we did this on an empty stadium, but we still saw lots and lots of access points. So <clears throat> here comes another challenge. None of the tools we use would tell us if we were using, um, if the access points were in low power indoor mode or standard power mode, because we have a mixture of both. Well, luckily, Adrian uh, does provide that information, where you see indoor AP or standard AP, that is found in this uh, control field under the HE operation area. If that regulatory info bit is set to zero, that's a low power indoor access point. If that bit is set to one, that means that's a standard power AP. This is important to know because if you do a survey, the survey tools will... What? <laughs> so you have to know this because when we do a survey, that's part of what we have to find out. So here is another thing that comes with doing this type of discoveries. Notice that some of the uh, beacons are transmitted and some are not transmitted. So trying to be efficient, if you have an SSID that is not transmitted, that means it doesn't have its own beacon. It goes embedded inside an, an SSID that is transmitted in the multiple BSSID element. So if my client cannot decipher, read this multiple BSSID field, it's not going to find the Aruba guest network. If the tool that I use to do a survey cannot read or decipher, parse this field, then when you do a survey, you will not find any non-transmitted SSIDs. So I would recommend check your tools and see if they do or don't scan this type of channels. All right, let's go back to where we started. Lots of APs. If I were to do a passive scanning here, then I will have to go to all these PSCs. But part of the solution that they provide is if we look at this channel, it's non-PSC, it's a 40, that is 9 and 13, 13 being the primary, that's where beacons are going. So if clients are looking just for PSCs, they're not going to find it. But if we go to channel 36, the same access point, is going to include a reduced neighbor report. I know we've heard about this many times. Here's where you find it. Inside the beacon, there's going to be a reduced neighbor report information element that has the AP, the radio, the channel width, the BSSID, and the short SSID of the network that I also happen to have in 6 gigahertz. 
which will make my scanning faster, because then instead of going channel per channel per channel per channel looking, I will just get a beacon in 2.4 or 5 gig, in this case 2.4 is turned off, 5 gig will tell me, hey, I'm on channel 36. Mm -hmm. But if you happen to have a 6 gig radio, then I also have this information. Now, <clears throat> We're up to the client. If the client can read this, then it will just go and do active scanning in that channel. One thing to note is now, if you don't know what the name of the network is, the SSID name, then you cannot send a wildcard, you know, missing open SSID in the probe request. So the clients will go, this is a different one, now it's on channel 101. It can send a pro request with something in it, the Corp network, or the Aruba network, or the missing network. Wait a minute. That was supposed to not be possible. I know. Clients still do things that, you know, like, whoa, what? So the right way to do is to, because it says, if you don't know the name of the network, and in this case, all I have is a short SSID. I don't know what the name of the network is, so I cannot go to 6 gig and send a wild card in the SSID. I have to include something. So it took me a while when I first saw this uh, probe request for network 80. And I went like, I've never joined a network called 80, and I look at the old networks I joined before and deleted them, and I was still looking for network 80. It's actually not an 80. It is 128 in hex. So if you don't know what the name of the network is, you have to include the value 128. So if you're capturing packets and you come across that, don't go crazy trying to find out why and where is it. it, it there's nothing. It's basically one that is following the rule. So. If PSCs provide a lot of benefits, and there are a lot of problems we don't use, so somebody came up with the, let's enforce the use of PSCs. We have to use PSCs. And if you have 80 megahertz wide channels, then yes, we have PSCs everywhere, and you have 14 channels, but of course, not here in Europe, but in the US we have, America, we've got more spectrum. So what if you have way too many either APs, you're in a big venue, like where we were uh, in, in that uh, Olympic stadium at the University of Utah, and then you are forced to switch to 40 megahertz wide channels. But you are enforcing PSCs. Congratulations, you have one more channel, and half the throughput of before, because you have to only use 40 megahertz wide channels that happen to have a PSC in it. The rest of the spectrum, lost. If you have way too many, you say, I'm going to use 20 megahertz channels because we have 59 channels. But if you're enforcing the use of PSCs, you still have 15 channels. And you're wasting all the rest of the spectrum. So, lesson learned. PSCs, they're out there. PSCs we can use, but we have to know how to use them. And does my vendor allow me to enforce the use, or does the vendor allow me to use non-PSC channels? Because if the vendor forces you to use PSCs, then you have that limitation. You're not going to be able to use all the spectrum that you have. Same thing is going to happen with the clients. If the clients cannot read non-PSC channels and networks have been advertised in non-PSCs, then yes, there is RNRs, but what if they don't listen to RNRs or they cannot read multiple BSSID fields, so all of that information is going to be relevant. And what if your tool of choice has issues, either scanning non-PSCs or not being able to read multiple BSSID information elements inside the beacons? Thank you very much. <laughs>